Hi folks, welcome to Urinary System Part 3, Making Pee. Okay, urine. So urine formation is a three-step process. Urine is primarily water, and in healthy folks is about 5% solids. Meaning that if you took a sample of urine and allowed all the water to evaporate, you'd be left with 5% of the initial mass. So these three steps are glomerular filtration, tubular reabsorption, and tubular secretion. Let's talk about the structures that are important. So we've got the afferent arterial. That's the arterial that's going into the glomerular capsule. The glomerulus itself, which is that tangle of capillaries inside the capsule and then the efferent or exiting arterial. So glomerular filtration <clears throat> pushes material out of the capillaries, so out of the bloodstream and into the cup of the glomerulus. In science, when we use the word filtration, we mean something really specific, but not incredibly complicated. Filtration, for example, is the process you use when you make coffee with a drip coffee maker. So there's either a paper or a metal filter in some sort of a basket, and that's where you put the coffee and the water drips through that, right? The filter paper, the coffee filter, keeps the large particles, the largest particles from passing through. And that's exactly what happens with glomerular filtration. We say that material moves from the bloodstream to the lumen of the capsule. Tubular reabsorption involves the nephron tubules, either proximal or distal convoluted tubules, and the peritubular capillaries, and in some cases, the collecting duct. Tubular reabsorption means that material that was pushed out of the blood in step one is being pulled back in, reabsorbed, in step two. So material is moving from the lumen of the tubules back into the blood. Tubular secretion involves material moving, additional material moving from the bloodstream, from the capillaries, and being secreted or pushed out into the lumen of the tubules. So urine itself is composed of three things. And actually, I guess the, the math folks would probably like it if I put brackets around this. So urine is composed of material that's filtered out during step one, glomerular filtration minus whatever is pulled back into the blood in step two, tubular reabsorption, and then any additional material, for example, hydrogen ions or certain kinds of drug metabolites that might be added to the urine during tubular secretion. All right, so essentially that's, that's the cliff notes of urine formation. We're just going to elaborate a little bit on it as we go through the rest of these slides. So glomerular filtration, 180 liters of blood are filtered daily if your kidneys are healthy. Now, remember when we talked about the amount uh, or the volume of blood in a typical person, the whole woman is gonna have four to five liters so if we say there's 180 liters filtered and a woman has four liters, that's 40 sometimes. The blood is gonna be filtered completely during the day. A big guy who has maybe six liters of blood, blood's gonna be filtered 30 times a day. That's pretty incredible filtering power. And that hopefully will allow you to see why when someone's kidney function is impaired, damaging substances, waste can build up in the bloodstream. So one of the important ideas about how glomerular filtration works is that glomerular filtration, it's hard to see in this image. I'm going to choose this one to be our efferent or exiting arterial efferent and this the app. Remember I said in the last lecture that the afferent arterial is, is thicker. That has the function 
really increasing the pressure inside cap these capillaries. And that forces more material out than would otherwise be the case. We'll talk in a minute about what actually gets filtered out. This process of filtration is aided by these crazy puzzle-like epithelial cells that sit on the top of the capillary. Um, there's one of them right there. They sort of, to me, they look like puzzle pieces. These fit together around the surface of these capillaries and they create what are called filtration slits. So it's an additional way of filtering in addition to sort of the the structure of these capillaries themselves, which is specialized, but we're not going to really focus on that here. So, right, we've got our afferent arterial. Blood is flowing into the capillary bed, the glomerulus. And in this view, we're looking at a section through what's called a renal corpuscle. So the glomerulus and the glomerular capsule together make the renal corpuscle. We're looking at a section through it, which is why you can't see all of the capillaries, or they, they look different than in the previous slide. So you've got unfiltered blood going in that's fairly high in oxygen. And then you have filtered blood moving out, still fairly high in oxygen because the point of the glomerular capillaries is not to drop off oxygen per se, it's to filter blood. And on the, over on the right here, we just have the glomerular capillary, or sorry, the afferent arteriole coming in efferent going out and then this is showing us that material is moving as shown by the dark arrows material is moving out of the blood and into the lumen of the capsule and then into the proximal convoluted tubule down into the nephron loop back around distal convoluted tubule and into the collecting duct all right so what gets filtered out well, the most important thing to remember here is that filtering is done by size. So in this image, what we're seeing is right here, if you look way to the left, you can see a glomerular capsule and the capillary bit, right, right over in here. If you take a teeny tiny piece of that and blow it up super large, we see a red blood cell right here, right? got some water molecules and I just I took the key out for all of these other little bits and pieces some of them would be platelets others would be really large proteins and these are the squamous epithelial cells of this capillary the glomerular capillary which is leaky and that's a, a difference. There are actually pores in the capillary itself that allow material to flow out. And then we've got those puzzle piece cells which are called podocytes. You don't have to remember that, but in case you wanted to know. The point to realize here is that the size of these openings, right? The pore in the capillary and the filtration slit here determines what can move out into the urine. So what does move out? Well, water, nitrogen-based <clears throat> waste, a whole lot of nutrients, surprise, surprise, like glucose and amino acids, and a whole heck of a lot of ions, right? Which remember are electrolytes. What stays in the bloodstream? What stays in are all of the formed elements of blood which remember are erythrocytes, leukocytes, and platelets, and the plasma proteins that you find in blood. So antibodies, albumins, globulins, fibrinogen, all of those uh, molecules are way too big, right? So when you think about what's gonna move through here, it's gonna be monomers, right? Which are the building blocks for polymers as well as water and salt. Tubular reabsorption, step two. Tubular reabsorption moves material from inside the renal tubules 
back into the bloodstream. And these are the cells of the tubule. You might have thought, when I described the previous slide, well, why the heck would you filter out glucose? Because you definitely need that and all of these other important nutrients and electrolytes. And the answer is, because that's the way it works. Evolution works with what it has available, not with a design that you might think of as ideal. So you've got filtration out of a whole lot of stuff by size, and then the reabsorption of molecules based on what the body most needs to keep. This, is, this table is, is showing us in data form a, what that looks like. And you don't need to remember super specific things from this table, right? Um, one thing to realize is that of that 180 liters of blood that's filtered every day, you reabsorb all but about two liters of it. That's crazy. Almost all of the water you know, and some of us who feel like we have to pee all the time probably doesn't seem like that. But if you're healthy, that's actually the case. We absorb even more of the sodium that's pushed out during filtration. If you're healthy, 100% of the glucose that gets pushed out is reabsorbed into, into the bloodstream. And that's why finding glucose in somebody's urine is suggestive that, that their blood sugar is uncontrolled. And then finally, even this waste product, urea, a fair amount of that gets reabsorbed as well because it turns out it's useful in small amounts, smaller amounts. So the, the reason why we reabsorb 100% of glucose and only some of the salt, the reason for the pattern of reabsorption and the reason why it's selective comes back to transport, cellular transport mechanisms. So over here we have, on the very left, we have the inside of the lumen of one of the tubules of the nephron, an epithelial cell, right, that makes up that tubule, a peritubular capillary down at the bottom, interstitial space, remember that Inter means between and stitial is space, so it's the space between cells that's filled with tissue fluid or interstitial fluid. And the point of these diagrams is to show you that the amount of any particular material that can be reabsorbed depends on the number of carrier proteins that are present on the side of the cell the tubule cell that faces the peritubular capillary. Remember that these processes take time and there are only so many carrier proteins. So the number of proteins you have limits how fast the process can go, or well, limits how much can be reabsorbed. And that's how you can tell if somebody has glucose in their urine that their blood sugar is likely uncontrolled because in a healthy, in a healthy system, there's enough time and enough carrier proteins to reabsorb all of the glucose. Last but not least, we have tubular secretion, which involves moving materials from inside the capillary to the lumen and adding them to urine. There are a bunch of different molecules that are shown here, but the one that I think it's most important for you guys to remember at this point in your education, hydrogen ions. And that's because that will help you to remember that the urinary system is one of the two systems that controls blood pH. Remember that the higher the concentration of hydrogen ions, the more acidic your blood is. And that also means the lower the pH number is. So if your blood starts to become too acidic. Remember, blood pH is tightly controlled at 7.4. Material, specifically hydrogen ions, is going to be pushed from inside the capillary into urine. And if you dump hydrogen ions, 
that will raise the pH of the blood, so decreasing hydrogen ions will raise pH number and it will make the blood more basic. See how I'm tricky in reviewing for the final here? Okay, so what we have in urine, to summarize, is the material that has been pushed out during filtration, so pushed out of the capillary, minus the material that is added back into, added into the capillary during tubular reabsorption, plus what is pushed out during tubular secretion at the end of the process. Now, one of the important factors that controls reabsorption of water is a hormone called antidiuretic hormone, or ADH. A diuretic is something that makes you urinate more, essentially makes your urine less concentrated. So if you add anti in front of that, um, antidiuretic hormone is going to lead the body to conserve its water. So if you start to get dehydrated, your pituitary gland is gonna release this hormone, which the kidney responds to by closing, here we go with the transport mechanisms again, the aquaporins, the channels that allow water to flow through the membrane in the distal nephron tubules, the distal convoluted tubule, and that then is going to conserve water. It's gonna keep water in the bloodstream and make urine more concentrated. All right, I will see you in the next lecture.